Informing our estimate of tragedy, let us first consider its externals, the hideous, appalling blank that the actor presents. Uh, spectral. Oh, yeah. Um, what's so hideous about it? Lukian.
How is that hiding? It's not hiding, it's maximizing. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. Let's see, this is there too. Maybe that's why. Nope. I don't get it. I don't get it. Hmm. It's so weird. Oh wait, no. It's still so weird. There we go. Sweet. Okay. I know, I'll make it easier. One and two. Voila. All right, major advancement here. So, what's so hideous about it? Oh, yeah, the appalling spectacle. In forming our estimate of tragedy, let us first consider its externals, the hideous, appalling spectacle that the actor presents. His high boots raise him up out of all proportion. His head is hidden under an enormous mask. His huge mouth gapes upon the audience as if he would swallow them, to say nothing of the chest pads and stomach pads with which he contrives to give himself an artificial corpulence lest his deficiency in this respect should emphasize his disproportionate height. And in the middle of it all is the actor shouting away, now high, now low, chanting his iambics as often as not. Could anything be more revolting than this sing-song recitation of tragic woes? The actor is a mouthpiece that is his sole responsibility. The poet has seen to the rest ages since. From an Andromaca or a Hecuba, one can endure recitative but when Heracles himself comes upon the stage and so far forgets himself and the respect due to the lion skin and club that he carries as to deliver a solo, no reasonable person can deny that such a performance is in execrable taste. Then again, your objection to dancing that men act women's parts is equally applicable to tragedy and comedy in which indeed there are more women than men. So, what is so hideous about it? 
Um, well, these tragic actors were dolled up in ludicrous uh, bulbous costumes. Son. Wah, who sober looks on sights like uh revelry? These um what sights must only a drunk look upon? Lee pole. Uh, here we are again. Drinking alone by moonlight. A cup of wine under the flowering trees. I drink alone, for no friend is here. Raising my cup, I beckon the bright moon. For he, with my shadow, will make three men. The moon, alas, is no drinker of wine. Listless, my shadow creeps about at my side. Yet with the moon as friend and the shadow as slave, I must make merry before the spring is spent. To the songs I sing the moon flickers her beams, in the dance I weave my shadow tangles and breaks. While we were sober, three shared the fun, now we are drunk, each goes his way. We may long share our odd inanimate feast and meet at last on the cloudy river of the sky. In the third month, the town of Xianyang is thick spread with a carpet of fallen flowers. Who in spring can bear to grieve alone? Who sober looks on sights like these? Riches and poverty, long or short life, by the maker of things are proportioned and disposed. But a cup of wine levels life and death and a thousand things obstinately hard to prove. When I am drunk, I lose heaven and earth, Motionless, I cleave to my lonely bed. At last I forget that I exist at all, and at that moment my joy is great indeed. If high heaven had no love for wine, there would be no wine star in the sky. If earth herself had no love for wine, there would be not a city called Wine Springs. Since heaven and earth both love wine, I can love wine without shame before God. Clear wine was once called a saint. Thick wine was once called a sage. Of saint and sage I have long quaffed deep. What need for me to study spirits and sien? At the third cup I penetrate the great way. A full gallon, nature and I are one. But the things I feel when wine possesses my soul I will never tell to those who are not drunk. What size must only a drunk look upon? Companionship of moon, shadow, and man. When he writes a copy in round hand size, does he cross his T's and finish his I's? Blank a dot. The Akond of Swat punctuate. Which grammar Nazi? Eh, not so much into nonsense poems. Oops. I read much of the night and go south in the 
morning, winter, what do you read? I thought that was the wasteland. The tired mother beats them and they roll on the floor and cry, shriek. Why did she beat them? See, what is that? And creative Unity by Rabindranath Tagore. Spelled wrong, okay. No, so no, 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 The house, lingering on after its wealth has vanished, stands by the wayside like a madman with a patched rag over his back. Day after day scars it with spiteful scratches, and rainy months leave their fantastic signatures on its bared bricks. In a deserted upper room, one of a pair of doors has fallen from rusty hinges, and on the other, widowed, bangs day and night to the fitful ghosts. One night the sound of women wailing come from that house. They mourn the death of the last son of the family, a boy of 18, who earned his living by playing the part of the heroine in a traveling theater. A few days more and the house became silent and all the doors were locked. Only on the north side in the upper room that desolate door would neither drop off to its rest nor be shut, but swung to and fro in the wind like a self-torturing soul. After a time, children's voices echo once more through that house. Over the balcony rail, women's clothes are hung in the sun, a bird whistles from a covered cage, and a boy plays with his knife, kite, on the terrace. A tenant has come to occupy a few rooms. He earns little and has many children. 
The tired mother beats them and they roll on the floor and shriek. So the question was, why did she beat them? A maidservant of 40 drudges through the day, quarrels with her mistress, threatens to but never leaves. Every day some small repairs are done. Paper is pasted in place of missing panes. Gaps in the railings are made with good split bamboo. An empty box keeps the boltless gate shut. Old stains vaguely show through new whitewash on the walls. The magnificence of wealth had found a fitting memorial in gaunt desolation. But, lacking sufficient means, they try to hide this with dubious devices, and its dignity is outraged. They have overlooked the deserted room on the north side, and its forlorn door still bangs in the wind, like despair beating her breast. Why did she beat them? Her husband earns little She lacks the patience afforded by security. Indian Brook in the Blank of Captain. Their faces are all worn, and in their eyes flashes the fire of sadness, for they see the icicles that famish all the north, where men lie frozen in the glimmering snow. And in the flaming forests cower the lion, the lioness, with all their whimpering cubs, and ever pacing on the verge of things, the phantom, beauty, in a mist of tears. While we alone round us, woven woods and feel the softness of each other's hand. Amrita, while going away from him, ah me, you love another, bursting into tears, and may some dreadful ill befall her quick. Huh. Hesitates? Anashuya. Ah, so that was who is talking. Um, okay, so... Does she love another? Does he love another? Yates. So this is from Anushaya in Vijaya, a little Indian temple in the golden age, around it a garden, around that the forest, Anushaya, Anashuya, the young priestess kneeling within the temple. And the question was, Does she love another? I loved another. Now I love no other.
that's weird. Among the moldering of ancient woods you live, and on the village border she with her father, the blind woodcutter. I saw her standing in her door, but now. Vijaya, swear to love her nevermore. Aye, aye. Swear by the parents of the gods, dread oath, who dwell on sacred Himalay, on the far golden peak, enormous shapes who still were old when the great sea was young, on their vast faces mystery and dreams, their hair along the mountains rolled and filled from year to year by the unnumbered nests of aweless birds, and round their stirless feet the joyous flocks of deer and antelope who never hear the unforgiving hound, swear, by the parents of the gods I swear. I have forgiven Onu star. Maybe you have not heard us, you have come forth so newly, you hunter of the fields afar. Ah, you will know my loved one by his hunter arrows truly. Shoot on him shafts of quietness, that he may ever keep an inner laughter, and may kiss his hands to me in sleep. Farewell, Vijaya. No, nay, no word, no word. I, priestess of this temple, offer up prayers for the land. So, does he love another? He did, but no longer. No, no, no. They are in more danger in your own family, among ill blank, allowing they be safe in their schoolmaster than amongst the thousand boys, however immodest. I've come across this before. They're among ill parents? Servants, yes. This is someone giving advice. I don't recall who. Um, why is the family dangerous? Ah, yes, the very mortal Ben Johnson. What happened to my preferences? Du, 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 du. What happened to my preferences? I don't get her, aren't those preferences? Happen to my preferences. Do, 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 do. What happened to my preferences? Lo, do, 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 do. anyway. Ben Johnson's discoveries are, as he says in the few Latin words prefixed to them, a wood, silva, of things and thoughts in Greek? 
from the multiplicity and variety of the material contained in it, for as we are commonly used to call the infinite mixed multitude of growing trees a wood, so the ancients gave the name sylvae, timber trees, to books of theirs in which small works of various and diverse matter were promiscuously brought together. One of the most vigorous minds that ever added to the strength of English literature. Timber or discoveries made upon men and matter as they flowed out from his daily readings and had their reflux to his peculiar notion of the times. The satires. Perse Perseus? Perseus satires? It was Perseus. Oh, no, 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 Okay, so Perseus <laughs> Here are all the satires You know what? I wonder if my whole computer is just bust with uh, size.
I think it should work now. Yep. Satires. Satires, satires. Satires. Satires, satires. Everybody needs somebody sometimes. It deserves our gratitude that you have presented a citizen to your country and people. If you take care that he prove blank to the state of service to her lands, blank in transacting the affairs of both war and peace. Why would you doubt him? Alarm then, wretched man, lest your entrance hall be fouled by dogs, should offend the eye of your friend who is coming, or your corridor be spattered with mud. And yet one little slave could clean all this with half a bushel of sawdust. And yet will you not bestir yourself that your own son may see your house immaculate and free from foul spot or crime? It deserves our gratitude that you have presented a citizen to our your country and people, if you take care that he prove useful to the state. The stork feeds her young on snakes and lizards which she has discovered in the trackless fields. They too, when fledged, go in quest of the same animals. The vulture, quitting the cattle and dogs and gibbets, hastens to her callow brood and bears to them a portion of the carcass. Therefore this is the food of the vulture, too, when grown up and able to feed itself and build a nest in the tree of its own. Whereas the ministers of Jove and birds of noble blood hunt in the forest for the hare or kid, hence is derived the quarry. What? Hence is derived the quarry for their nest, thence too, when their progeny now matured, had poised themselves on their own wings. When hunger pinches, they swoop to that booty, which first they tasted when they broke the shell. And again, this is 
all towards answering us. Why would you doubt him? The person here. What are these things? Okay, so this is the 14th satire of who? Don't even know. There are very many things, Fuscanus, that both deserve a bad name and fix a lasting spot on a fortune otherwise splendid, which parents themselves point the way to and inculcate upon their children. If destructive gambling delights the sire, the heir, while yet a child, plays too, and shakes the self-same weapons in his own little dice box. Nor will that youth allow any of his kin to form better hopes of him who has learned to peel truffles, to season a mushroom, and drown becaficas swimming in the same sauce, his gourmand sire with his hoary gluttony showing him the way. When his seventh year has passed over the boy's head and all his second teeth are not yet come, though you range a thousand bearded philosophers on one side of him and as many on the other, still he will be ever longing to dine in sumptuous style and not degenerate from his sire's luxurious kitchen. Does Rutilus inculcate a merciful disposition and a character indulgent to venial faults? Does he hold that the souls and bodies of our slaves are formed of matter like our own and of similar elements? Or does he not teach cruelty that Rutilus, who delights in the harsh clang of stripes and thinks no siren song can equal the sound of whips, the antiphates and polyphemus of his trembling household? Then is he happy indeed whenever the torturer is summoned and some poor wretch is branded with the glowing iron for stealing a couple of towels? What doctrine does he preach to his son that revels in the clank of chains, that feels a strange delight in branded slaves and the country jail? Do you expect that Larga's daughter will not turn out an adulteress who could not possibly repeat her mother's lovers so quickly or string them together with such rapidity as not to take breath thirty times at least? While yet a little maid, she was her mother's confidant. Now at that mother's dictation, she fills her own little tablets and gives them to her mother's agents to bear to lovers of her own. Such is nature's law. The examples of vice that we witness at home more surely and quickly corrupt us when they insinuate themselves into our minds under the sanction of those we revere. Perhaps just one or two young men may spurn these practices whose hearts the titan had formed with kindlier art and molded out of better clay. But the sire's footsteps that they ought to shun lead on all the rest and the routine of inveterate depravity that has long been before their eyes attracts them on. Therefore refrain from all that merits reprobation. One powerful motive at least there is to this, lest our children copy our crimes, for we are all too quick at learning to imitate base and depraved examples, and you may find a Catiline in every people and under every sky, but nowhere a Brutus or Brutus's uncle. And again, we're to answer... Deserves our gratitude you have presented a citizen to the country if you take care that he prove useful to the state. So, essentially the negative example here, um, this would be a well-reared child. Let nothing shocking to eyes or ears approach those doors that close upon your child. Away, far, far away, the panders wetches the songs of the parasite that riots the livelong night. The greatest reverence is due to a child. If you are contemplating a disgraceful act, despise not your child's tender years, but let your infant son act as a check upon your purpose of sinning. For if at some future time he shall have done anything to deserve the censor's wrath and show himself like you, not in person only and in face, but also the true son of your morals, 
and one who by following your footsteps adds deeper guilt to your crimes, then forsooth you will reprove and chastise him with clamorous bitterness, and then set about altering your will. Yet how dare you assume the front severe and license of apparent speech, you who yourself, though old, do worse than this, and the exhausted cupping glass is long ago looking out for your brainless head. If a friend is coming to pay you a visit, your whole household is in a bustle. Sweep the floor, display the pillars in all their brilliancy. Let the dry spider come down with all her web. Let one clean the silver, another polish the embossed plate. The master's voice thunders out as he stands over the work and brandishes his whip. You are alarmed then, wretched man, lest your entrance hall be fouled by dogs should offend the eye of your friend who is coming, or your corridor be bespattered with mud. And yet one little slave could clean all this half a, with half a bushel of sawdust. And yet you will not bestir yourself that your own son may see your house immaculate and free from foul spot or crime. It deserves our gratitude that you have presented a citizen to your country and people if you take care that he prove useful to the state, of service to her lands, useful in transacting the affairs of both war and peace, for it will be a matter of the highest moment in what pursuits and moral discipline you train him. La, 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 mo, anamo, anamanamo, 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 anamo, la, 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 Cool. Okay. Yeah, so that's the uh, the sentence. The stork feeds her young on snakes and lizards, which she has discovered in the trackless fields. They too, when fledged, go in quest of the same animals. The vulture, quitting the cattle and dogs and gibbets, hastens to her callow brood and bears to them a portion of the carcass. Therefore this is the food of the vulture too when grown up and able to feed itself and build a nest in a tree of its own. Whereas the ministers of Jove and birds of noble blood hunt in the forest for the hare or kid, hence is derived the quarry for their nest. Hence too when their progeny, now matured, have poised themselves on their own wings, when hunger pinches they swoop to that booty which first they tasted when they broke the shell. Centronius had a passion for building, and now on the embayed shore of Caeta, now on the highest peak of Tiber, or on Praenestes hills, he reared the tall roofs of his villas, of Grecian and far-fetched marbles, surpassing the Temple of Fortune and of Hercules, as much as Posides the eunuch outvied our capital. While therefore he is thus magnificently lodged, Centronius lessened his estate and impaired his wealth, and yet the sum of the portion that he left was no mean one. But all this his senseless son ran through by raising new mansions of marble more costly than his sires. Some whose lot it is to have a father that reveres Sabbaths worship nothing save clouds and the divinity of heaven, and think that flesh of swine from which their sire abstained differs in naught from that of man. Soon too they submit to circumcision, but trained to look with scorn upon the laws of Rome, they study and observe and reverence all those Jewish statues that Moses in his mystic volume handed down, never to show the road except to one that worships the same sacred rites, to conduct to the spring they are in quest of, the circumcised alone. But their father is to blame for this, to whom each seventh day was a day of sloth, and kept aloof from all share of life's daily duties. All other vices, however, that's a very interesting uh, paragraph that uh, where participation in Jewish religion 
is put down to sloth uh, and a, 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 an inclination to sloth and uh, uh, tribalism. All other vices, however, young men copy of their own free choice. Avarice is the only one that even against their will they are constrained to put in practice. But this vice deceives men under the guise of s and semblance of virtue. Since it is grave and bearing, austere in look and dress, and without doubt the miser is praised a frugal character, a sparing man, and one that knows how to guard his own, more securely than if the serpent of the Hesperides or of Pontus had the keeping of them. Besides, the multitude considers the man of whom we are speaking a splendid carver of his own fortune, since it is by such artificers as these that estates are increased. But still increase they do by all means, fair or foul, and swell in bulk from the ceaseless anvil and ever-glowing forge. Wow, these satires are long. Okay, so who who was this? Look at all these footnotes. Glorious heaven. What a rain cloud of precious jewels. Good God. So these are the satires of Juvenal. Let me just make sure that we were uh, looking at this. Juvenile crowned. Yeah, this was it. Taken me so long to ever learn juvenile after all I've already ruined. Good God, good God, why? Avarice is not a friend of family value. People learn to be Jewish from their parents.
The intended reader of the satires was highly educated, perceived threats to the social continuity of the Roman citizens, social climbing foreigners, unfaithfulness and other extreme excesses of their own class. Primarily adult males of a more conservative social stance Decimus Unius uni Univalis. Satires are a vital source for the study of ancient Rome from a number of perspectives although their comic mode of expression makes it problematic to accept the content as strictly factual. Biographers agree he was born in Aquinum and also in allotting into his life a period of exile, which supposedly was due to his insulting an actor who had high levels of court influence. Juvenal claims as his purview the entire gamut of human experience since the dawn of history. Satura quidem tota nostra est. Very interesting. Oh, la 
look at this. The Tertullian Project. Wow. 38 volumes. Gotta get it. Gotta get it, gotta get it. Gotta get it, gotta get it. Gotta get it, 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 gotta get it. Gotta get it, gotta get it. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Gotta get it, gotta get it, gotta get it, gotta get it, gotta get it. Get it, 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 get it